Well, oh, it's been quite an interesting couple of days, really, isn't it? Absolutely, I, mean, uh, I quite enjoyed not, it. Um, not seen one for 11 years. What's that? I think I'll start uh, with control. an issue. I, I started at LWT as a, an engineer and it was on outside broadcast. And at the time, we shot and recorded on, and so did the studios, on quad tape, two-inch tape. And, and editing then was an engineering function in the VTR department. So I would have never been an editor at LWT ever because I was in the wrong department. You didn't use to splice the tape. You actually used to cut the two-inch tape. I used to develop it and cut it. We talked all about oh, that oh. yesterday. So. Yes, I used to cut um, play schools um, on, uh, with a razor blade, one single recording because it was cheaper that way, one tape. You cut it. If you made a mistake, you were in big trouble. And if you're cutting the tape, you'd have jumps on the cuts, unless you've got the eight-field sequence right. No, 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 no problem with two-inch tapes it at all with a quad. Okay. No, the problem was the sound, because the sound and the vision was displaced. You, if you cut for vision, then the sound was all over the place. If you cut for sound, the vision was over the place. So you had to lay off onto a quarter-inch, and it all became a bit of a... Dex dexterous is the word. You needed to be dexterous with syncing up quarter inch to the two inch, and it all happened in ten second run ups. And it was it was interesting. It was interesting, but very 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 basic. You didn't have edit controllers or anything. Ab basically. No, no, there were no edit controllers. There was or time code. <laughs> there was no, no time code. There was an editor. There was an editor that would actually do an electronic cut when we started copy editing on two inch. But there was no controller to get the two in sync. It was wind the two tapes back ten seconds, put a little China graph mark on the tape run them simultaneously and at the point you had chosen on the edit machine the edit would happen now if the player was too loose too tight then the, the assistant which in my case w which it, in those days was me as an early when I joined in 69 you tighten you move the tape two inches one way two inches the other way have another go see if it's right yes no and when you got it right hit the red button and with a bit of luck it did the same as on the rehearsal but there was no guarantee that that would ever happen so editing was yes was very basic not frame accurate yes. what happened was all of the equipment in this period we're talking about pre-80 was incredibly expensive and, and was typically only owned by the broadcasters because you couldn't afford it and so what happened in the 80s, which was a paradigm shift, was that Sony and Panasonic came into the market and introduced products, both camera for sourcing and editing, that was affordable. They were the, the one-inch machines? Well, beginning of, yeah. yeah. So that was, I left LWT in 1980 because of that. Mm. Bought the first two portable cameras on the market, which were the... the Sony 330 and the Ikigami HL79A. And I still find it amusing that HL stands for Handy Looky. <laughs> and 79 was the year of design, and A was the first one that year. They went up to a D, so there were four of them. And when, when I left with a cameraman, Nigel Reynolds, and we formed a company called uh, App, uh, Red Apple, that's right, we were Red Apple. So we had two cameras and two blokes, and uh, both from the LWT. And uh, the cameras were in the region of 30 grand uh, a pop. And our first job, uh, we, were shooting, we were recording onto a separate deck, which was a BVU, which you carried over your shoulder. And, and, and on the day of our first booking, it was for ITV, and it was a telethon. God, I can't Do you remember those. And we had four sites to go to for the first night. And, uh, and we had to pick the cameras up out of customs at Southampton. Mm. So we went down there, charged the batteries, took them out of the box, and went and did four shoots. And that night, I, in those days, the IBA used to mark every broadcast uh, as to the quality of the video and audio. And that night, our four sites were marked one and the IBA wanted to know who on earth had done four sites that had one, because they'd never had a one before. <laughs> and it was these new cameras. And the difference was they didn't need lining up virtually. And they worked out the box, as you were just saying. So that was the beginning of, and, and what happened with the, on the other side was, from that day on, we were booked almost every day. And we used to shoot a music video a day. And, and, it, and every day we'd end the day at Molinaire probably converting the BVU tape to something they could edit on because no one had BVU editing by then. What, when you say BVU tape, what is that? Is that a one inch or a three quarter? Set? Oh, it was, so that it is actually one of the, the set, standard. Yeah. Yeah. U yeah. Umatic? Yeah, it's a Umatic yes. format, oh, Umatic, but yeah. it was called broadcast video Umatic. Right, yeah. 
that's what the old BVU stood for. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't bad quality at all. And um, so, but, but when I realized that every day we was, the client was spending this money, and I think it's worth saying that one of our regular clients was Ridley Scott, who at the time was a boy doing music videos. So mm -hmm. then his brother did it as well. And, um, and we used to do one video a day and, and then take the tapes for conversion. So I thought, this is ridiculous. I'll buy a couple of BVUs. <laughs> so we bought a couple of BVUs, and that's how I became an editor, editing the music video at the end of the day. And I have to say to this day that when you're there on the shoot, it's much easier to edit the material because you're familiar with it. And we're often a collaborator in how it was shot. So, And then other, other clients came along, um, trying to remember some names. Um, but. Um, after a while, I was editing every night now, so you couldn't shoot as well. And, and I decided to try something new, which was convert the output and put it onto a one inch tape. It, so it became BVU Oof. to one inch. And what we found was that the pictures looked better because it had, the one inch machine had a much better time base corrector. Mm. And therefore it was worth the value of the machine and the extra cost just to do it that way. So after probably six months of doing it very manually, mm. I bought the first Sony 5000, which was a, another Japanese thing that worked out the box. Mm. And that edit controller, which we had a, a derivative of here, the 900, mm. you could teach it slow motion and everything. And you, then you could modify it and things like that. And then you, of course, had a lovely list that you could go yeah. back on. <laughs> and that was the beginning of me being an editor. and. Um, of course, it was very rapidly that the clients became corporations, as well as people like London Weekend. We used to do the I used to do the London program and things like mm. that, and they would shoot that on film and convert it to BVU to come and edit it on tape, which was bizarre. <laughs> I originally started in film, and in fact, I'd been working on film for, for many years in the BBC as a film editor before. Um, I. My, my department, film dis department, realised the writing was on the wall and we were going to have to start to look at using, working on video. And it was only possible because the BVU, the, U the cassette tape, the Umatic cassette tape had come out, one, so therefore it was easy to load. The cameras had got lightweight um, and two, the particular SP version of the U-Matic was accepted as a broadcast standard by the BBC. Um, and there was a reality of the future, much as a lot of film editors were thinking, but, 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 you know, it's, we hadn't really appreciated this whole concept of non-linear and linear, but they could see that tape was a linear system. You couldn't be as creative and as flexible because you had to lay a shot down, record the next shot onto tape, record the next shot. And if you suddenly just wanted, well, that's, I don't really want that second shot at all. You, you, you had to go another, you had to make a copy, a new copy, and actually then edit that shot out as you made that copy. And that was going to be a rather tedious process because the, the whole art of filmmaking is doing lots of changes all over the place. Also, if you're copying it back in the old days when it was composite, the quality oh. goes down, so it gets fuzzier and fuzzier, fuzzier the more you do. Fuzzier, absolutely. In fact, I do remember in the very early days when we, I'd, I worked on a pilot for a direct with a, with a director friend of mine for the B, but it was some like pub conversations, and our technical and training department said we just got in. A, an early VHS offline. Would you like to have to use that as a free as a free edit? And well, I said, "Oh, it's fine." So I said, "Yep, okay." So I had a little quick bit of training on how to use it, and so we we, we transferred the rushes off Umatic or whatever it was onto to VHS, and and then I started editing, and I you know went to generation, and then right I said, "Let's start cutting it down a bit," and so I did this edit, and um, I said to the director, "What do you think? Is that all, is that all right? Me trimming it there?" And he said. I'm sure it is, Rod, he said, but when I can't really see the picture, I'm not sure how I can judge it. <laughs> because I really was. That was before SVHS, mm. and it was purely yeah. composite. And honestly, just even going a generation, yeah. it was looking pretty awful. But anyway, so to move back, we, we decided that we were, yes, we were going to start to go 
um, and start training people to be able to use the pneumatic system. We didn't have an agreement at that point with the unions, um, which was rather, I mean, the un I say we, the, the unions hadn't come to an agreement to the fact that, okay, we could produce stuff on pneumatic, but would the television centre recordings department accept it from us? Current affairs would, because we did provide editors as film department to Nationwide and, and Panorama, who wanted film editors to cut their programs, and the news department who actually did the transmissions that said, yes, yes, we will accept that. So the first two editors that trained were from Nationwide, and I was on the second course, and one of them was another Nationwide editor, and myself was basically out in the general service area. And I remember after I had been trained, three weeks of training, so they, we, we, we sat in a little classroom at Ealing, and there was a couple of camera crews, and there was a couple of two, two editors, when it finished, I wasn't actually allowed to do anything because the unions hadn't come to an agreement yet for the for to for us to actually for me to cut something and then for me to pass it over for transfer to one inch. Um, but when when I finished the training, one of the things we did was the film department said out to to to, to production in general, we will offer you a free half day's filming with an Ealing crew with a portable single camera, we, sorry, we called it portable single camera, we had to give it as an acronym, and, and, and we called it PSC, portable single camera, camera, which was the def, you know, for a, a pneumatic camera, separate recorder with a cable, which the sound recorders hated, um, and uh, the BVU edit system like we have over here behind me. And um, so you'll get half a day free crew, half a day free edit. So you could come up with a little project of yours and see what it's like trying to do it. And obviously for me, this was like now I'm also, this is part of my learning process on how to actually do with that edit controller the kind of things I'd like to do on, on film with split edits and cutting, the, getting out of vision and cutting the sound. So it was a very big learning process for me. And actually, it wasn't, it was fine. The only problem I had was two of the directors I had were ex-film editors. And they were slightly aggressive and almost called me a traitor to film editing. <laughs> Seriously, and I was, by the time we'd finished on that little half-day session, they were accepting this was a horses for courses situation and maybe it did have a place and maybe I was able to do the kind of audio editing that you would want to do, etc. fair enough but it was a bit stressful. Now, other members of production came along and said, I do remember one, he'd gone off and he'd shot, just for the heck of it, um, a daughter and a mother doing a quick, a quick cookery, like I mean, there's many cookery programs now, but he's, so he shot this making, I can't remember what they were making now, and he came to me and I sat down and we went through it and we produced this, in this half a day, a complete little, cookery mini quarter of an hour program. And he was saying, this is fantastic. Here am I, I've been able to use an Ealing crew to film, I've used with a single camera, and I've been able to come in and I can walk out and I've got something that I can transmit. I'm gonna go straight off to my head of department and say, look, look what we can do now. So it was interesting, but I also knew without a doubt that this, to a certain extent, I had to accept that we're going to take a step backwards in the terms of creativity in being able to change my mind on things. And I was going to have to become, which I did when I was using this system, because I did go on to do a series of six half hours on Rough Justice, and, and then I eventually did a 75 minute by the end of the year, a big one on the Libyan siege. The reason why I did it, why well you might say, why did you do that on, on a BVU system? Because all of the original footage that they was shot by news on a BVU system. So the most ideal thing was, really, the best way to edit this is on a BVU system. Mm -hmm. um, but it did mean, to a certain extent, you had to kind of, you had to be a bit disciplined, you had to be a bit organized, you had to think, you know, now, can I try and just spend a little bit more time on this sequence and get it pr more, more, more right, as it were, more polished, because I don't want to have to keep coming back and play, play around with it and go too many generations. Um, because in those days, you, if you went too many generations, if you like, copied from one assembly into another, made another one, then put that over and copied again, you know, and the quality would go down, you would then have to go back 
and reconform, i.e. paste in from the original rushes on your final version, all of the shots. And that was obviously a bit of a tedious process. I think that's very interesting for me because I, I was not yet an editor, let's pretend, so I'm about to be, but I was creating the drama, I was shooting it on the road for LWT, and it's a very disciplined process, and it's all done with a script, and, and the PA would mark the script, so it was very, very specific where the shots were going to come from and where they were going to go, whereas with news, you, you, it's much more flexible. Mm -hmm. So when, by the time drama started editing in, in proper suites, not, not two-inch ones, you already knew what was going to happen. I mean, the difference for me as an editor at the time in the outside world, once I started editing, was if a, if, if a, if a broadcast came in, like I used to, what's the one I used to do? Uh, Mind Your Language, which was a, a, a comedy from LWT. You came in with a perfect script, perfectly marked up, and we could put that together and have it on the air within eight hours of the start of the edit. Uh, so that was the difference. And then the corporate clients would come in the flexible ones were the, were the music videos where you made it up as you went along and, and that's where linear obviously was an advantage because you could juggle about and mm. keep changing it. So, And the corporate clients had learned that because they were paying by the hour that they had to be organised so they were always very prepared to come in the edit and just do it and give you the numbers. In those days they would give you the numbers if you were lucky. And then what developed out of that was VHS offlining with the burnt in time code copy um, and they they did that to save money in the online because if we go back to that period you know an online suite was anything up to 400 pounds an hour so it was a lot of money mm. and they could be in there for two days so so they wanted to save money mm. which you understood yeah. but it did become collaborative in that you could make uh, suggestions and they would listen and we had you know effects that they never had mm. before and things like that so slowly their, pro, their product improved, but as an editor of the time, my favourite clients had always shot on film and converted it to tape for editing. And I found very quickly, as the editor now, that the people who'd done that typically had been film directors and had a better eye for a shot and everything else. So, and they had expectations that you had set in your previous life, if you like, mm -hmm. and suddenly we're expected out of the blue to catch up with. Uh, which was probably what I enjoyed about it. I think um, people were, there was a stage where it was a lot more creative in the online yeah. process, wasn't it? Um, you know, you actually could make fundamental changes to a film in the online yeah. rather than the offline. It was, uh, whereas now, you know, that's not really done. No, no. The editor at that time, you're right, was a collaborative part of the team, mm. and you were. Ex I, I'd like to think we were expected to contribute, but. If you yeah. spoke to some of my clients, they would tell you that some of the places they went to, the first thing the editor would say was, give me some numbers. I, my thing I realised with corporate clients is they often didn't know what they were producing it for, let alone anything else. So you had to drag it out of them first thing in the morning. And in the early days of me being an editor, four jobs a day was typical because they were only two hours ago. And, and it could be a commercial first, then a bit of corporate, then a fix for yesterday, another commercial, then go home. And so you had to deal with four different mindsets in a day, which, which yeah. can be a nightmare. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think, so, um, yeah, I was going to say, for, I think for me, I came from, because um, I went to uh, London College of Printing in uh, 1982, so I was there from 82 to 85, and all that time, you know, learning all the different skills of, you know, directing, producing, camera work and everything. Um, I found that uh, even when I did my first, well, there I was editing on film and we had 16 mil and we had uh, VHS edit suites as well. And so um, the editing was, some, was something that, you know, I did the edit, obviously created the film in the edit and my, my particular project or a group of us would have our own project and we'd finish it in the edit and it was more about wasn't so much about the the kit as just you know getting the film finished if you see what I mean because I was I suppose I was coming at it as a director and um, and then when I went to when I got my first job after college it was at a corporate video company and I was assisting a producer um, and we made sort of on 10 15 minute corporate films for um, um, Avis and TNT and people like that and. The, that producer would do literally everything, so he produced, directed, edited, 
and so I was sort of learning from him then within the confines of the gear that they had which I think was Umatic. I think we had B2SP as well, it was GHA group and, um, and then he left and I, I, was, I became a producer then and I, th I feel like it was a similar process because I can only remember, I remember doing the editing, the editing the offline I, um, and I think we could online there as well um, and but I don't particularly remember I think it's a bit about what you were saying about being there on the shoot because I was out filming yeah. it and then to come back and I would just edit it to create whatever it was I, th I was, you know, the film that we'd gone out to shoot as it were. So it was only after leaving that company that um, I suddenly started working with, as an editor, with other people's material. Yeah. Um, and that was a whole different experience and that was, I think it was still on VHS and you matter, you know, it's tape to tape. I think it's worth saying now for the viewers <coughs> that we all say all these words offline, online, mm. low yeah. band, high band. These are terminologies we're familiar with and they're not. And, mm. and what offline means is normally editing the material at a lower quality yeah. to save money. Having to and then, copy it. And then to copy it format, later yeah. on in the same format at the right quality on the right equipment. Yeah. Uh, so it was two, a dual process. One was preparation and one was finishing. Yeah. And I, I didn't used to call it linear editing, I called it progressive because you could <laughs> only ever go forward. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think we had a kind of process like that in <coughs> film really because we shot on a negative and they they would give you a rusher's print from that and you'd edit that and it would get absolutely filthy and would be covered with tape joints and in fact in the early days when first, colour first came out you couldn't afford to have all your rushes in colour even though you shot it, it had all been shot in colour you were only allowed to have 10% of actually as colour rushes. I know that. Yes, <laughs> the BBC um, mm, mm. and then of course so when you finished then you'd go and like online you'd send off your cutting copy to uh, uh, the neg cutters and they would then go through and f match the little key numbers back to the original negative, join that all up, and then you'd send it back to the labs, and you'd then have your brand pristine new sh answer print, which is the first version, or a show print, the answer print was just to check the colour. You'd say, oh, well, I want to change the colour here or there, please. And then so that would, you'd grade it, and then you'd get your show print. So it was a similar, a similar kind of a process, only your rushes were almost as good quality as what you get back on the show print. There's no reason why there shouldn't be any difference apart from it might be a slightly cheaper stop they'd be printing onto. <coughs> Unless you'd shot a nectochrome reversal. Ah, yes, yes. And right. then when you edited that, that had to be it. That was, so yeah, which, the, which, which is mainly news. Yeah. Used yeah. it, which is one we reason why that. news <coughs> went, yeah. went, were one of the very, very early users in the BBC of the Umatic system. And but I think an important point offset. to make here is when, mm. when the neg was cut, it was done somewhere else, you sent them the information yes. and they literally yeah. did it yep. as you a gave them the copied the list mm -hmm. effectively. Yep. So they went it through was, and yeah. magnifying glasses, read the little numbers. And I think I came a different route from most of you because I came straight in to a facilities house and I was there from the age of 18 in what was that, 88, 89, something like that. What was that? Uh, uh, Air TV, Toleo. Oh, you know, know Air TV or oh, Toleo yeah. there in Camden? And so I worked, oh, I, know my, where it was. Yeah, I worked my way up from research recordings. Yeah, research recordings as used to be, yeah. Um, and up to editor. And we, we used to do, I learned because, you know, linear editing in those days, online linear editing was very complicated, uh, much more so than offline, because offline you're doing the in and outs and the mixing. There's no disrespect. It's just incredibly the, the amount of um, technological know how you had to have to get the online edits to work and all the effects you used to put on it was it, it required a lot of knowledge in those days. Yeah. Which, I mean, these days anyone can do offline edit. But online then, you had your DVE. I'm not sure you can say anyone can offline well, you edit, because the can, edit is making the program. That's true, but you can cut it. it. It might not be good, but anyone can cut it. So they can't cut it well, but anyone can cut it. Yeah, no, I think the offline is where the program's created. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. no, and and then, as you say, the online. But the online, we had, to, we had to save everything, basically. Or we had to make it work, to be the truth of it. What we put out had to be the finished, final, uh, it had to look spectacular as, as much as we could. With, with the, the approval of the offline yeah, editor? Yeah, with the approval. Not always, actually. <laughs> Very rarely would the Completely offline editor come into yeah, us. Yeah, I don't yeah. like no, to no. hear the word, we had to save it. No, no, that's not true. I'm being a bit, uh, bit cruel there. Well, but also, we'd, we'd, you know, we'd be grading DVE um, uh, captions on top, all of these things. I know, I know. It, and I think it depends on who you work for. Yeah, exactly. The, on the online guy certainly was the skilled with the advanced equipment. With the, exactly, but we wouldn't well, be creative. The company I worked for didn't mm. like the Aston caption generator. Yeah. So the art department would create all the titles 
themselves and I'd bring it in and it'd be put under a Rostrum camera. Oh, those are and even some of the effects, uh, an effect that you can do now easily on the Avid, for example, mm. was a ripple, a ripple between mm -hmm. one scene to another. I remember holding sheets of glass <laughs> under a Rostrum camera and what have you. We so had the, uh, I, you know, the A57 could do those. but the uh, yes. is who makes the program. No, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm never going to argue with that. Being an offline like editor. Like we would, at those times, in, different out. disciplines. That's all at yes. that point. Oh, yes. They were very different. Um, yeah. the, you know, these days you can do so many of those effects in Avid. Yes. But then you couldn't do any of that in offline. I so think if that, 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 that word discipline, mm. I, I think of as very important in online editing, which is what I used to do. I, purely, specifically online editing, nothing else. You had to be disciplined because in the world of sport that I worked in, you were on the air at 10 o'clock and your half of, first half of the football match had to be finished. And it, if you made a mistake, it went out as a mistake. So discipline, getting everything, make sure you got all the goals, all the incidents that the producer wanted, make sure you can get all the necessary replays, all, all the cleverness that you can put into that show, but you have to be on the air at 10 o'clock. End of. There is no, oh, can you hang on, can you ne ask Network to hang on five minutes because Ross okay. hasn't quite finished yet. <laughs> no, not an option. Um, Remember many a day on Ski Sunday being rung up by network saying, um, right, can we do the lineup now, please? We'd like to make sure. I said, well, you can do the lineup if you like, but if, if you do that, we're not going to get the show on the air. I've got five minutes to go and I haven't finished yet. So just <laughs> give me that five minutes and I'll get your show on the air. Talk to me much longer and you won't. If discipline had to do it, you had to build inbuilt time clock in your head to work towards that transmission time. And that was online editing in sport. Uh, and fast turnaround stuff, which uh, another discipline completely, that, that's the route I came through. I was doing some of that as well. I used to yeah. do Italian football with, uh, narrated by Kenneth Wollstonehome. Oh, right. Um, and exactly the same thing. You've got to get it and yeah. you've got to finish it at that point, otherwise it's not going to make air. Yeah. And, but I mean, it, you know, you must have done other things as well in the online world. Was it all oh, sports? yes, absolutely, yes. No, everything. I did everything. Yeah. Drama, ballet, um, concerts. And they're all different disciplines as all well. All different disciplines, yeah. Music uh, well, was I've, a different I've one. Well, I've got to say, because I agree completely that with my view and my experience over the years was as I became a, a better and better editor, which I love, by the way, still do, um, film directors would say, you must have been a film editor because you're so good. And I said, I've never been a film editor, but at LWC I was a location manager, so I could choose whether we shot on film or tape. So I learned both disciplines, which is which are quite different, but the same at the same time. So. One of the things I found on lining at that time, particularly with corporate clients, they were too close to their own work because they already thought their shit didn't stink and it was perfect. <laughs> and they would come in and you would find them repeating stuff, you know, like... Yeah, well, the less is more. Less is and more, I always, yeah. Have you ever seen a director's cut that's shorter? <laughs> Never. <laughs> you know, yeah. the word yeah. discipline <laughs> and organisation, because you're saying about discipline, I, I think a film editor was disciplined because he had to know where everything was, all those bits of trims hanging. And, uh, and then I started in film, carried over to tape, tape to tape editing. And I think that has to be well organized as well. And something we haven't uh, mentioned is um, the cameramen would put a roll number. And if you had access to the camera and you'd say, can you start from one? And then when you went to the online, the online <laughs> editor had to know where that cut was coming from. And if you'd messed up there, the time code means nothing to him. It needs yes. to know which role it's Absolutely. coming from. And all organisational things like that, which followed on to Avid or non-linear, well, because some people who were good at computer work weren't organised, and the great thing about Avid, which I think was grasped by film editors, was bins. Divide your material into relevant bins, label them as such, then you could always find it. And, and that, sorry. sorry, that carries into the online as well. Just, just pop back. We're talking about uh, offline, I, and we described what offline was in editing either or VHS or um, pneumatic. One of the problems for me, because you, you were only given a two machine suite, a player and a recorder. Working on film, we did dissolves, we did fades, we put on titles. How did we do that? Well, we used Chinagraph and we did this, we drew Chinagraph on the film. And when, when you were watching a film and then you suddenly saw a line appear on the film that would go across the picture and then cut and then go back, you knew that was a dissolve. Or if you saw two, start in the middle and you saw two lines going like that, that was a fade in. 
Now that would either be a fade-in of a shot or it would be a fade-in of a title. Um, and of course, you couldn't do that on this system. You, you, were, you were just say, we're going to have a dissolve here, but um, and it will start round about now, and then round about <laughs> now. And but when we go to the online, we can define what it is. And we'll yes, go, that's what yeah. I mean when I say, and you go to the online and you have a list of things <coughs> yes, exactly. that you really wanted it to look like. Yeah, you know? The titles there, the fade in there, etc. Yeah. But of course, then you could do a lot more than you could with on film. You could do what you could do in, a lot more effects more easily because I'm saying on, on film titles had to be you had to send them off to do an optical. Um, and you had to get it dead right. And, where and it would you're degrade. talking about marking up the cutting copy with a china graph. Yes. That was to sh indicate to other people and the neck, the neck cutter cutters. that or you couldn't use that same piece of material again. Well, as well. As, as that, well. That and the great mean. thing about Avid is and you, you have to shot know that. duplication, don't you? Mm. Right. So you can choose shot duplication. Yeah. And so as you're doing your timeline, you say, you can see you've already used that shot once before. But it doesn't matter. That was if your original had been on film and you transferred it over on to video for digitising into an Avid, and well, therefore if, you if did have to be tape. careful. You couldn't re, you couldn't reuse something because obviously no. it didn't exist on the film. It no. only existed once. Yeah, there's once. two things, isn't there? There's yeah. one putting a shot in twice by mistake yes. in, in your yeah. whole yeah. film. Yeah. And yeah. Which, what which I, I remember in the early eighties, <laughs> because we were one of the, you know, we were one of the first facilities to have a full digital suite that you could do instant dissolves and most of the clients used a director who'd worked on film so that was the only place they could have been making stuff and and they'd say oh we're going to have a dissolve here and you just go duh, 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 and do a dissolve yes. oh we'll have one everywhere now yes, so yes. suddenly you had dissolves everywhere well, it's like no, when they came really through the, yeah, ADOs, ADOs, DVA, or the ADOs yeah. and the DVEs yeah. as soon as people got DV and digital video effects <laughs> yeah, you'd see them everywhere yeah. Yeah. and now yeah. you look oh, back on it, it's incredibly really tacky yeah. Yeah. but at that oh, point yeah. it was so amazing yeah. Yeah. Like, we can make the great this lovers yeah, of the exactly. latest technology weren't they yeah they were I mean the you know the Star Wars Zoom was a picture of Zoom up I remember when the Quantels first came in on um on um, educational programs, I remember the cube, the, the rotating cube, <laughs> yes. which was done on a Quantel, which you had to get a special effects man in for. Mm. And, and as an editor, you'd sit there for ages waiting for him to sort out the the, the sides of the cube. It was, it was, I mean, this was 80s. This was very uh, clunky compared with these days. But uh, I mean, the, those old Quantels were something else they were fun um, to play um, with though great fun because they were also instant you'd be there and you'd just you'd be turning a knob and it would happen in front of your eyes now with avid it's still you're sort of, it's not quite the it's same not it's not as tactile no, it's, 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 it's you're dragging a fader job, but, um, and on tape if you wanted you were talking about dissolves or effects then the online editor would have to make a copy a dump tape so that he could go from one to, you know if you had to still have a duplication <laughs> somewhere so they could or I think maybe in later times on the online you could put it into a, a memory. Yes, page. you'd have a, yeah, we'd yeah. Have a uh, well, digital that, store. Yeah, when pre-read came in, pre that all went in. away because yeah. then the, when pre-read came in, the, the offline notes, if you like, or the EDL, the edit decision list, came down. If it was going into a pre-read capable suite, then the outgoing shot would have a couple of extra seconds. Actually. We should probably explain yeah. pre-read. Well, you're going to get that. So, the, so the, out, yeah, the outgoing shot would have a couple of seconds extra put onto it so that when you went back to do this pre-read you would have some material to dissolve mm -hmm. off of. Now pre-read was a system of on a, on a helical um, machine head, there are lots of heads actually on there, that a hell of a lot, up to sort of 15-16 heads on those machines. There's a record head, well four record heads, four play heads and there was a thing called a dynamic tracking head which in in a linear timeline appeared ahead of the record head. So it could actually see the pictures before you recorded on it. So you could pluck the pictures from a time slightly ahead of the record head and put them into your vision mixer and then mix them with the new incoming material and record them back onto the same tape, one or two tracks behind what it's looking at. Now this came in for us in 1992 with D3s. And this, of course, cut down the made possible the, the fact that you could put dissolves in with just two machines and you didn't need to buy a third one. Machine was £40,000, saved a lot of money. Yeah. I still remember coming it in, it's like time travelling. It was like magic. Yeah. How, can, how can you do this? How is this possible? It, but we'd it, still need it. We'd still, because I used to build lots of multi-layer things. And so we would have three machines, uh, a recorder, two source, plus the pre-read, and plus running two A66s at the same time. So you'd be running five sources at once and mixing between them on multi-layered multi uh, vision mixers, firing off GPIs and getting captions running at the same time while mixing the faders live. It was, uh, 
You yes. don't want to make a mistake in those days. No, so we've mm. just heard a new a new phrase, GPI, so yeah. GPI general purpose, purpose interface, yeah. which enabled you through the edit system to trigger something else to happen that, that you time couldn't time. manage with your fifth Ooh. hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. use them all the time. Yeah, of course, so, you had uh, to. And I mean, then you'd also be able to do vision mixer snapshots. So yeah. the vision mixer would actually, at some point, run like a sixth or seventh machine, and you could actually run it like a timeline. And so the vision mixer would allow you to bring on captions, mask things, move masks, and also at the same point move the DVE with the digital video, video effects around. So lots going on at once. When yeah. did choice of fonts come in? Well, well Aston had choice of yeah. fonts. The first Aston. one I had had Aston choice of fonts. But if someone was specific? You had to buy them. Yeah. <coughs> was it you that said you worked on Nationwide? Not me. Yeah, I did yeah, work on Nationwide, and but I mean, the, they the, were the done in the studio. I was, a di was directing stuff for me had a specific interest in fonts. And it was no good going into an online and saying that's near enough. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think like they had to the buy BMW. the discs. Pardon? That's like working with was it, it wasn't John Tidy, <laughs> was it? When he no. no. Um, but I just wonder when a choice came in. I'm and trying to remember so now. Many. I think the Aston may have had a problem. You couldn't use two fonts in one line, mm -hmm. but you could have Ooh. different fonts yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, it, well disc, didn't they? In, the, in going back early days, BT editors never got a credit on any show that came out of a studio because they never knew who was going to edit it when the show was recorded. <laughs> so some series did, uh, and in fact I did a couple of episodes of 40 Towers but never got a credit for it. And uh, the, the excuse from the producer was, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't know you were going to be editing the show. So I got John Tidy, the graphic designer who worked for a company called Wormses. I said, John, can you make me up a 12 by 9 card um, so that when the producer says to me, I don't have a credit for you, I'm very sorry. I'll go in my briefcase and hand him one. I said, here you are, here's my credit. <laughs> you could have had a T-shirt, you know. But was I that should. because they'd actually done the roller in the studio? Yes, the it was all done. Yeah, it's all done in the studio, yeah. yeah roller or captions. It was sometimes changing cards on, on right, two, on two cameras that. and the, right, the, the 12 by 9 stacked up on, a, on two stands and someone would pull a card, the camera, they'd mix to the other one, pull a card and we yeah. very, very... You know, it's almost laughable these days what, what <laughs> how yeah. television was made. Well, in the those final days. test at the BBC at that time for a director was that he could do 24 captions and get it right because they were pulling all of them. <laughs> were uh, they letter set? Well, they had to give yes. a cue, didn't oh, they? Yes, yeah. they, they were letter set. Were they? Were they letter set? So you had to say, well, take well, one, pull. I'm not sure because did, <laughs> did, did, didn't Alfred Wormser and his merry well, yeah, men yeah, yeah, produce yeah. all these? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, John Tidy was Wormser's, yeah. 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 Uh, um, well, when I was at London College of Printing, when I was at London College of Printing, uh, doing photography, film and television it was, um, we had the film systems, like I said, and I, I don't really remember the actual um, classes where they taught us a steam back and they taught us the VHS. I think we were, we must have been, you know, obviously we must have had some training, we did have tutors. Um, I do remember you know, playing around with it, especially the VHSs. Actually, I remember playing around with them. And um, did any of you have training? I had no training. I had to teach yeah, myself I was every in the single BBC piece of kit. The BBC was always mm. good about training. That yeah. was one of the very distinct advantages. So I was had probably about two to three weeks training on on the 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 UMATIC, the PSC system, if I may mm. dare call it that. And then again, well, when it came to the nonlinear later, I was actually put into position to actually say, right, we're going to buy, our, we bought our first Avid, yeah. and I want you to learn it, and then you start training people. So I actually became a trainer in the BBC, until our own training department suddenly said, hang on a minute, what's going on there? We're the trainers. But, but so I did do some training, and we did train people. We would take them, uh, you know, you'd have a week, a week, I would have two people for a week, and train mm -hmm. them. And it was, it was interesting, so it, sadly, probably people of my generation had more problems because, you know, it's a keyboard. And that was certainly an issue. Um, whereas the assistants, the younger ones, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, oh, this is quite fun. But no, we were, so, in the, and then of course, you, you'd probably be given time also to play. You'd be, we, we'd have some test edit rushes that you, that with, with scripts and say, no, now you've had some training. If you like, you know, you can go and spend a week or a few days having having a go and actually you know, get used to it. Mm. 
when, in the two inch days in the BBC when, when I joined, editors were editors and engineers were engineers, although the editors had come from being engineers and you were assigned to a programme um, which maybe let's call it an electric edited programme which was the, the edit tech which, which I was explaining with the, the, the edit point is defined but the, the play in tape could be was purely in the control of the engineer who went back his 10 seconds. Now as an engineer you would sit on the other side of the room and the editor would say I want you to come in there or there or just before that word or just after that word and you'd wind back your 10 seconds, put your China graph mark on, run it up and eventually you'd do all this and you're in awe of the editor because how does he do all this but eventually you would learn what he was doing by a sort of osmosis process, you would gather why, why was he asking me to tighten there? Why, why, why was that wrong? And you, you'd get this and then sometimes you would ask to swap over if it was a simple programme and some editors were uh, conducive to you swapping roles. So you would be on the other side, the editor was playing into you and if you had a problem obviously you could say, um, yeah, I'm in trouble here. Or uh, having asked the producer, of course, if they minded if you did that. And then we got on to a bit more confident, you would say to some editor, well, uh, look, you, you've got play school this afternoon. It's five, five programmes to cut together. Um, would you mind if I did it? And the editor normally thought, no, that would be great. I can go and have a cup of tea. So I'd ask the producer, would you mind if I do it? And they would hopefully assume that you knew what you were doing. So you'd go in there and take on the stress and the pressure of putting a razor blade through five programmes and hoping you know, that was going to go straight to the transmission suite in a couple of weeks' time. And that was a learning process there. Once we got on to single machine, singly manned edit suites, like using the 910 controller, then you were on your own. So the learning, the, the learning process for new people became more difficult because there was not that role where you were assisting an editor uh, in, in two inch days playing in and looking at, looking at the edits. Perhaps the assistant on the suites was just purely changing tapes, but actually learning being there right at the sharp end, learning, looking, watching, seeing what was going on, was a great that, training. Isn't it? It's more than that, because it's also client management. If you, I don't, depending on oh, yeah. who you're working with, but you're learning those skills of how yes, to deal with yeah, yeah, skills. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what the facility industry did as a facility owner was we used, every year we would employ runners, and runners were T-boys, really, and, and they had the opportunity. We would give them a year's contract if it became anything at all, and they would serve the edit suites through the day and with the opportunity to stay at night and work yeah, in the it. departments. And then if they were any good, and you knew that very quickly, if they were any good, is you'd get them to do the loading overnight. So they began to use the machinery hands-on. So that was the introduction. And then out of that, you are very quickly know if you've got an edit potential guy or not. Personally, I had no training at all, except that I got myself ask, asking myself uh, as I started to become an editor and became an editor and started winning awards and people started saying you're a very good editor you must have been a film editor for instance why am I a good editor and of course I stood in the, the control room of a drama unit for 10 years with the very best directors in the country and without even knowing it had learned what a good and a bad cut was because they would look to me as a unit manager and say, that's yeah, all right, Phil. <laughs> and, and, you know, you became a contributor, cool. collaborator cool. with people like Jim Goddard, Tony Warmby, all those people at the time who knew how to do it. So you were picking it up yet again. You're picking it up and it's, suddenly it's going in here. So, and so then the industry, the facility industry, develop ways of doing that and that was to make them do the menial tasks and see if they were any good at it and if it they weren't you quickly fired them. <laughs> and it was one it, it, it was one problem when we when we first moved over to tape and then particularly non-linear film department you had film editors and they had assistants and the assistants would be learning from the film yes, editor right, yeah. and so when we got to this situation particularly when with the avid lightworks initially we were allocating assistance, but basically what was there for them to do? Nothing but to sit in the back of the room. And okay, do you want another coffee? Yeah, no, I'm fine, thank you very much indeed. And we very quickly realized that this couldn't carry on, we were gonna to have to change this. And of course, we also, the question was raised, how are people going to learn how to, how to operate this, the, 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 the equipment, but more importantly, how to edit? Mm. How do you know? Um, I'm not sure we really solved that problem, and uh, as you know, but it is an industry-wide problem, isn't it? I used to work on Big Brother, um, and it's actually where I met Amanda. 
Um, and one of the things with Big Brother is because of the, over the, the nature of it, there are lots of overnight shifts because of the fast turnaround of it. And I used to post-production supervise at this one point. And we would have edit assistants who would be helping doing the digitizing overnight or creating copies. But also, when they were free, they could help the editors. And so for them, it was a perfect learning time. They would have that overnight time when they could actually go off and cut sequences. And many, many editors have come from that route. Um, so there are still ways, but it's really hard for young people now mm. to get into it. You know, yeah. especially if you're working on documentary, there's no there's no call for anyone to sit in the suite no. or to learn no. how to cut. Mm. No. I think I'm freelance um, even worse, which I was freelance. Yeah. Tape, you just had to get on with it. But because I was freelance, often I'd be going into a facilities house like Todeo, mm. used to go in there quite a lot, mm. and there was always someone there to ask. I did the avid course at the National Film School, which I paid for myself. And then again at a facilities house, if you were stuck, hopefully there was a room where the boys were doing the machine room and what have you, you could go down there and say, I don't know how to do this. I'd have yeah. to reverse sometimes. <coughs> when I was a, a linear online editor, there'd be some editors I'd work with who'd purposely try and blind you with science because they were so nervous of their job, they didn't want to teach anyone else how to do it. And you know, if you knew what you were doing, you're just like, mate, it's just this. It's, it's not as complicated as making it out. But some people would be the reverse and not help you. Mm. I think by the time I'd done um, college and then worked with a corporate company editing on tape to tape, and when I left there I worked with some really good directors, so that was fantastic. But it was the, at least, you know, knew how to use the gear and basic editing and, and, um, and then was just allowed to work on doing more and more complex programmes. And then, so by the time I uh, went to Spitfire, um, and I was doing some freelancing at Spitfire, and they had a, an avid to beta test, one of the first ones in the country, um, when I saw that, I could really appreciate that um, uh, you know that I'd be able to straight away edit you know non-linear in a non-linear way uh, on this computer, and I just completely fell in love with it. Um, but the reason I mention it is because I learnt from the manual, I had to get <laughs> literally get the manual out and like just go through it, you know. I think we've all had that exactly yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was surprised. RTFM, you know, it was quite a yeah, good yeah, manual. Yes. <laughs> and then it was suddenly like, okay, we've got a job coming, and it's like, oh. I had uh, to find on a the friendly job. Re uh, facilities house. Well, and I think the learning is a again. contributing factor of all the things we've all said. And if you've worked with a good director and you do a good cut, he'll tell you. Is it, mm. We're learning two things. There's learning yeah. the equipment, but there's exactly. also learning yeah. how to edit. Yeah. Yeah. Learning yeah. how to edit. Separate yeah. things so you entirely. can't teach editing. Mm. You know? no. I think it's no. intuitive. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. I think that other listen. people have to tell you that you're good at it, not yourself, because yeah. you don't know. Um, okay, go on a bit more about that earlier. Yeah, I was going to say what it could and couldn't do, what the joy was, and what the challenge was. Yeah, um, well, I think one of the things about people skills and being with people um, was important to my career because that's why Stefan asked me if I wanted to come and work with him on that machine because um, I was one of the people that got on best with the clients. So that just gave me a head start. And then um, I think with the machine, um, yeah, I just learnt it, you know, the best I could, but. Um, as you were saying earlier, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you, when you're offlining or you're, you know, edit, making the editorial decisions and creating a programme, really, you just need to know how to cut in and out. <laughs> you know, you're creating the programme. You just, you know, you don't need to know how to do many, many things, mm. any layers or whatever. Um, That's why the um, online guys are paid a lot more than the offline. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to, yeah, they have to work quickly. <laughs> um, so, I think. Um, but what my memory is that, um, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. It was, you know, it was such early days that it was, there were the constraints of storage space. And I'm, I remember doing hours. I did a 48 hour shift once. Um, only once. Trying to get, <laughs> yeah, 48 hours only once. Yeah, I've never done that since, thank God. And, um, well, well, you know, overnights in the facility game was normal. I mm. mean, two or three a week probably. Yeah. And of course, you're not at your best. Um, and, and the best thing I used to find was to say to the client, "This, you know, this is going nowhere because I'm about to go to sleep because yeah. we probably had two bottles of wine by then anyway <laughs> as well." So, yeah. uh, and stop and let's start fresh in the morning. But and that was the truth. But, but if you've but got, it did if happen. you've got space in to book something in the next morning, you know, yeah. sometimes you're up against transmission and someone else is booked in the next day. It's got to be done. Isn't oh, it? absolutely. That, yeah, and that was a discipline of broadcast television. Mm. So, so doing a show like the one I mentioned, which is Mind Your Language, they, we used to start eight on a Saturday morning, and they'd come in with a properly marked up script, mm. and everyone knew which tapes we wanted, and it was marked up. And by four o'clock in the afternoon, 
you're just looking to see how much you've done and how much is left to do and if there's enough room on the tape almost but how many more shots mm. and then you had to do the credit roll and then the director's wife would come in and want it in bigger la letters <laughs> and then that would waste another hour and then you had to get it on a bike over to LWT for transmission mm. literally um, and, and so you, there was a discipline in doing that but when I look back at my own career what, how did I learn good timing? Well, first of all, by being in the box with directors, but you said it earlier. In live television, you don't go on the air at one second past ten, you go on the air at ten o'clock, and that's yeah. the end of it. You don't yeah. even we think don't about it. have late planes in, and, in television. And you you know, have right. to be on time. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And it's amazing how that discipline goes through into the edit suite, mm -hmm. you know, in, and now it's a frame, but it's the same sort of discipline that you mm. grew up with for 10 years. So. Well, that's the thing about n the new gear, like when the Avid came in, there's everyone learning how to work differently, isn't it? Yeah. The producers, a, the directors. I, I do very, very early Avid. I, I, I did find it a bit of a constraint. One of the problems, you couldn't shuttle or jog. You, were, you could either just go forwards, or you could go for one frame at a time, and it would play a little bit of sound, or you could go ten, forward 10 frames at a, at a time. Um, and. And also, you didn't have a scrolling timeline. Yeah, when, when it were, first came out, yeah. yeah. And in fact, what I used to have to do with the timeline, I would take the timeline window and I'd put it on the second monitor and fill the second monitor and fill it with the whole timeline. So I could actually sit there with my mixer, play it, and I could actually see at least it would scroll, so you'd have the whole program there and you could scroll over it that way. But it was really it did come on leaps and bounds by about version four or something, five, when you suddenly had the... the the, the scrolling timeline came in, you could shuttle and jog, and suddenly I could be much more productive and go you know, backwards and forwards and really find a, an edit point much more, much more easily. So um, I've got a question that you've triggered in my brain. What's the longest programme you've done on a non-linear format? Non-linear? Non -linear. Yeah. 75 minutes. Um, maybe yeah, I, did, I did a nearly two-hour movie and it becomes very unmanageable. Um, that's the, and so what I did was broke it into four bits and did them as you know oh, yes. thirty. No, minutes. that yeah. Well, you wish you, you would have. I, I found that that was broken down in sections by the mm. by the length of the tape because I did it on on Umatic. Yeah. Um, yes. No. That was it's better now, but yeah, back in the old days, everything was slow right yeah, down, uh, slow yeah. to a crawl. Uh, same it, frustration as you is what I'm saying. Really, was wanting to see the timeline and see it all working, or um, even just pressing play and then yeah. having to wait twenty seconds yeah. for it to start going. Yeah. Well, you, you I have to hands, say, yeah. having been around at the beginning of both bits of this, the client uh, coming into a linear edit in the 80s would have been quite well prepared as much as they could. They wouldn't necessarily have done an offline, but they would have done a, a paper log and they would have a format. But they very often, I would start the day with the client and ask them what the purpose of the program was because there was a sort of corporate, an un, 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 unwritten corporate law that five or six minutes was about as long as anyone was ever going to watch. So if they've got a 20 minute program, they're probably wasting their time. And, and very often you could cut it right down at that stage just because they realized you were probably right because you were doing it every day and they weren't necessarily. I think I had a different experience to you because I was working a lot with MTV in those days. Yeah. And so they would come in straight from the shoot with the rushes and we would just create something there and then, sometimes with effects or... Well, that's what yeah. we did with the music videos, because yeah, no one exactly cared. And I mean, what yeah. amazed me about shooting the music videos with people like Ridley Scott, they didn't even have an idea what they were going to do. They just went out and did it, <laughs> and then we would come back and edit it, because it didn't matter. But it's also, you know, great fun with those things. Oh, it's a, it's yeah. a great learning experience to go through those things. We go, we'll try this now. Yeah. So what happened, we found, as a facility, as a facility, when nonlinear came, we had a new problem because they all thought it was going to be cheaper. Uh, but, of course, they forgot we had to digitise everything overnight to make it ready to go. And so there's a charge for that, which didn't, they didn't like. Mm. And as a facility owner and the editor, mm. you had to deal with that, is the point. And, and so slowly they got used to that and began to budget for it, so it was quite good. And then they they vastly improved their offline, without a shadow of a doubt. And also, but it's changed, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. because of the flexibility now I have with Avid, and because you don't have to spend the time, I mean, people do still do some time logging at home, but most don't. Most will come into the edit almost cold, 
Yeah. And and you'll create it with them. So it does become much more of a well, collaborative. It becomes collaborative. Yeah, yeah. much more and collaborative. That's I think it was what I would prefer to do. I mean, you yeah. guys would be able to tell me that I didn't work on film, but I would yeah. imagine now it's more so because it's all in front of you and much easier to access. It depends on the yeah. client. Isn't it? You get um, a client that knows exactly what they want or the script is following whatever the development mm -hmm. is. But you're saying about um, uh, discipline. Again, it's getting everything organised in advance, whether it's tape or non-linear, is success or not success. Well, and I mean, cost, your camera tape, so we're shooting on, camera, on, mm -hmm. on tape on the camera, the, that's one cost to the client. And then you get overnight rushes onto it, pneumatic or VHS or burnt in time code. Some of them didn't like that, the cost. And then, of course, you're hiring a suite somewhere to edit it. And that's mm -hmm. when you, I, I, we, a company I work for, we do a 20 minute program and I'll be given five days to do it. But wow. it's no matter what the, <laughs> no matter what the footage. Well, whereas sometimes we've got complete the reverse. I mean, yeah. generally I work on hour long programs and they'll come into the edit and they'll have an idea of what they want to make but it will change so dramatically in the edit and so that they have to go out and do reshoots and of course they've budgeted for eight weeks um, and that will go on. The last one I think I was on went on for 13 weeks and I came in after they'd already done eight um, to finish it off because the story's not right. So mm -hmm. it's great if you can prepare for it but of course sometimes it doesn't work yeah, out. Well, it's probably a different type of program. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. I, my, my job only ever got extended once when the, um, when the client lost his temper and whacked all the keys <laughs> on the Avid and I just said, well, that's it, you've just lost everything. So. Well, the, the main thing I did with my clients was, was to educate <coughs> them into the fact that there were three disciplines to worry about, really, with the edit. There's the edit itself, there's the graphics and the sound, and there's no point in sitting in the edit suite making graphics. Make them before you come. And then that speeds the process up, and then go and do the sound afterwards. And most of them did that and got a better product for it and of course inevitably they wanted to do a deal on price so you just do a deal that makes it work for everybody so that was how I did it anyway. So it was the same for tape or non-linear yeah really is prepare as you much because as you have voiceovers yeah. graphics what effects do you want uh, different versions mm -hmm. just do a music and effects track so they could put different voiceovers on it um, mm -hmm. all those uh, things needed to be worked out in advance I think us in the BBC <coughs> had a, a different relationship with our clients, if you like, because the clients were staff as well. So in the early days, I was allocated to a job by a VT supervisor who would put me editing whatever it was with somebody, perhaps I knew them, perhaps I didn't. And that was the accepted thing. The, the producer would come down and, oh, hello, who are you? I've not worked with you before. Yes, I'm Ross. Well, OK, that was, that was it for the day. And then the next day I'll be doing something else. And that, and that carried on for years until... We, got, we did get the system, you call it producer choice if you like, where the producer thought, well actually I quite like working with him, not that Ross bloke, he's terrible, but I quite like working with him, so phone up, I get the phone call, sometimes when I was supervisor, can I work with uh, that chap I worked with last week, he was good. So you jiggle the sheet, so that then started the process of editors working in particular genres, and uh, when we moved into the 90s and moved to our new building upstairs, we were put into categories of what basically you did whereas the early days I used to do everything from children's programs to dramas to music sport obviously a lot of because I was good at it and I knew a lot about it when we moved into upstairs I became specifically sport and um, I lost a lot of those other things which I did really enjoy doing um, I guess that's the outside world, how the outside it's world works. It's still the same. I mean, if you're, you get pigeonholed. You do. Yeah. yeah. You so do. You're, an, you're a drama editor. You were lucky in the BBC. You're then. an entertainment editor. These days, I don't know. You guys are the same. You're a documentary editor. It's very hard mm. to move between the different yeah. disciplines again. Because um, I was thinking, I was just sorry, I just wanted to go back quickly to, um, I was thinking of when I first started editing um, documentaries, this used to do quite a lot of half hours and a lot of youth TV. And, um, and the clients, the, the producers, the preparation that they used to have to do before they came, they, they, were, they were allocated a lot of time to do prep and they would come very prepared. I know we've slightly talked about this already, but I just didn't manage to say that um, I, f I um, yeah, they used to come in with all their sheets and having sort of looked through everything and an idea of what they wanted and then we'd obviously make the programme together. And then as time went on, um, like now, for example, I think 
uh, generally, obviously the interviews of for something like Panorama, for example, all the interviews have been read, and depending on who your producer is, um, they they will have or will have not looked through the material, and also depending on how much time that everyone's got. Um, did you get transcripts? Yes, did get transcripts. Yeah, you did. yeah. So. Yeah. I used um, to get, in certain client, I used to get good transcripts, and they used to interview a lot of people that English wasn't their first language. Yes. So they would pay to have the transcript in English and as a line below or above, mm -hmm. however, the, language. the oh, yeah. language. So you could pick up more or less the foreign word yeah. and think, oh, I must be there. Mm -hmm. um, and But that cost a lot of money to do because that was like eight months of shooting. Yeah, because I remember initially, well, in the earlier days, um, before Pan I worked on the New <coughs> and Current Affairs, on the documentaries, we'd go, we'd go through the whole interview, we'd go through all the footage actually in the edit. Uh, yeah. Together, me and the producer, me and the director. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, it, it, when we got onto the avenue in news and current affairs, it was more of, you know, the the interview would be looked at separately and possibly the footage. But um, you'd have more command of the footage though, because you'd have everything on there. And that was another thing that changed as well, because we used to put all the footage in ourselves, uh, yes. we digitise it ourselves into the avid. Um, and then it got to the stage where that was completely impractical and you you turn up and all the footage was already on. So your job was to actually sort the footage out, and, you know, organise it all in all the bins, um, and often the producers hadn't seen it yet and the directors hadn't seen it yet either, so then you'd go through it together. Um, well, so the whole organising process completely changed, but the more organised you could be, then the, the faster the, the edit yeah. was. But uh, clients didn't understand that, I think. No, and, and, and what are you doing? <coughs> and you're just, you know, sitting there trying to just label yeah, yeah, yeah. shots. And, uh, and the, as a money-saving exercise, they started to get, which you've mentioned, really, is digitising overnight. Yeah. And then the editor, or, or me, or whoever, you'd go in there for the day, and then you, have you got a shot? I've no idea. Because no. you haven't seen it. Yeah, you haven't had a chance to look at it. And so I'm going to have to look. Can we just correct? No idea. And that makes you look awkward. And you have well, to view everything at high speed. That's what I was yes. going to say, because at the end of the day, I just... have got time to sit there and just let it play normally. Yeah. I don't go on a bit of fast forward. And, oh, that one, maybe that might work. Yeah. Yes. No, I found myself... It took me years, actually, to to work out how to do the films in the time that you're supposed to do them in, because I just would stay, you know, late looking at all the footage. I just wanted to stay ahead all the time. But, and then, um, you know, when you'd have the viewings, um, once you'd start, you know, got the cuts and you started having the, the viewings, what was brilliant was to be able to make the changes um, as people were sort of, well, there were a few things that were brilliant. One was to be able to duplicate the programme um, on, the non, on the AVID, so you could duplicate your programme and have lots of versions of your sequence so you didn't lose anything that you'd done before. Mm -hmm. Um, but what was brilliant was after a viewing, when everyone was sitting around for hours talking about what changes we were going to make, and you know, even though we were supposed to be kind of locking, completing the film the next day or in the next few days, um, you could actually, while they're talking, just be making the changes and trying yep. to keep up with them. Exactly, this is brilliant. Exactly, and they'd be like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you could just you'd sit there and they, you know, every now and again, you'd say what you thought about a certain sequence, but. Yeah. Um, I soon realised that actually I could just be making, the, put my headphones on and just making the changes that I heard, um, heard them say, um, you, try and keep uh, up with them. Have any of you experienced any changes with commissioner, with commissioners coming in for this sort of final say off with the programmes? Because for me it's, feel, it's been the same for the last 20 years or so since uh, you know, I've been working on Avid. Commissioners come in, you're still making changes exactly the same way. They'll come in, have a sort of a final say and then you'll make the changes and go back to them. Has anyone else got anything different? Well, I was going to say that the first thing that's impressed me is that all the BBC guys have been referring to the people who they worked with as their client, which I think is the right attitude, mm -hmm. because why shouldn't it be? I mean, in my, because I own a facility house, yeah. the client is the guy who pays the money, and his, his client is the guy who comes in is the commissioner. Yeah. And the times they come in and they haven't even looked at the offline and then wonder why the programme's beginning to look like it is, it's just amazing. Yeah. And it's because it's not their business. Uh, yeah. But it is the client's business to inform them of the business. And, uh, and offline, I'll tell you a story when we're done, <laughs> is unbelievable. I think one thing, one thing that's really helped and, and changed things is uh, being able to do the quick times. Yeah. Quick times, you know, so you do a, a quick time file of your film at any stage and you can then, you know, send it oh, to whoever needs I'm to see it. I'm not a fan of that because what happens is you'll send it off and they'll give detailed time code notes oh, Lord, yes, and yes, then you yes, can't yes, argue yes. it. You can't say, well, we've made this decision for this reason. 
and then it suddenly becomes an edict that you have to change it because they've said so, and it, it can become very, very tricky. I used to leave a wrong shot in deliberately. So <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> <It's been> <laughs> <there>. <laughs> oh, yes. Save the, the pick-up on. Yeah. Prove they watched it. <laughs> Let's yes. pick up on it. And <laughs> yeah, really I, really I really like it. It's something to criticise them to make sure they've had their little input into it. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's just to save, well, it saves days in the, in the edit suite, you know, with people watching the film when you can just send them a quick time or, you know, I mean, the other thing about QuickTime, which is really good, is that you can, um, uh, when you're you know, working with the producer and you're sitting editing literally a sequence, then you can give them that sequence and they can be working on updating that sequence yeah. and you're getting on with the next one. Write the commentary for it, whatever, yes. Because you are, you are collaborating, but at the same time, it's all about time. And it is quite nice to have that little bit of quiet time on your own, you know, not to have to wait till everyone's gone home to I always get really creative. Work in progress to be dangerous because very few even good people know what that means mm. even though they're the ones working with you. So many commissioners who come in and say yes it's no problem I can view a rough cut and then yeah. they go well we need some voice over here and it's like <laughs> it's a rough it's cut. A rough yes. cut. Yes. Yeah, I did have a client ask why has my program got burnt in time code? What's those numbers? <laughs> well they won't be there when we finish it. But Promise. Yeah and this was someone who was an experienced company. Mm. You know. I had one producer came in at the, the, the final, you know, knocking. It was literally at the end of the day, and he was got a plane booked to Heathrow to go to Tokyo at 11 o'clock at night, and it's now 9.30. And he looked at it, and he said, that shot on the golf course, can we cut the grass? <laughs> <laughs> the storage, that, that started to change relatively quickly when you could have enough storage. You, and I, I, and I think the other thing that did change um, and was the fact that it became online. I know when it comes to doing large form things, though um, per people would still work offline, but I have a friend who, who still does very long form documentaries on Avid and he's online all the way. What he hands yeah. over to the online suite is transmittable stuff and all the online suite has to grade it and put the, and put and legalise it, make sure of the colour levels, etc. Okay, mm. and that's one. That's a dramatic change now. And so therefore, you can do all the effects yourself. You can do everything that you desire. It happened very quickly, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was Avid came in around 92, 93, yeah. and we were working online quality at AVR 77, which yes. is just about yes. considered on quality. 75, 77. Yeah, yes. we we got that in 97 where I was working. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was very, I mean, it was hard because, of course, that eats up your storage. You're, because you're working oh at that yes, high yes, resolution, yes, 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 yes. you need a lot more storage to yes, do it. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to be, often you'd have to but be very cautious because you'd work offline, first of all, and then possibly reconform because mm -hmm. you didn't actually have the storage to but, work everything. But this Moore's law online. came in, you know, every year for half the price, you've got twice as much. Yeah. 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 And how about all the changes that if you really wanted to drive the online Avid with all the sort of extra effects and all that, how much training is provided for that? <laughs> much of you make up as you go on? I mean, that's yeah. staying late, Read isn't it? the manual. Yeah, yes. yeah you, go, you go, I know I can do this, so if you just leave me alone for an hour, yeah. so I'll work exactly. out. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, if I go back to 96 and the uh, Atlanta Olympics, I was told by one senior editor, that tape is dead, and by the time the next Olympics comes, there will be no tape, it'll all be avid. So I said, oh yes, I won't say his name. I'll believe you when it happens. However, in the four years, I, I thought, and I saw what was happening, and I thought, this is the way we've got to go, at least for some of it, because the story-making side of sport, the flashy stories, mm. they need it, because the producers want it, because they can change their mind. And so, okay, <coughs> for the Sydney Olympics, we have to have some avids. So we got, I think it was four out there, Media composers, is that, would yeah, that be right? Yeah. Yeah. Media composers out there with their own storage separately. Yeah. Now to cut a long story short, we come forward to the last one I did, which was 2006, and we were running quite big Unity systems, which is um, collective mass storage. Everybody can access everything else. And so you can feed the event, not only just your little story into the um, system, you can feed the actual live event. So if you're doing a story about today's pole vault, you can record today's pole vault as it happens, literally as it happens, and pull in media that evening, pull in media quarter an hour before it goes out. So that, that from looking at it from the outside as I was a tape person, that was a huge change. Still didn't do away with tape. Tape was still going a long time after mm. I left, so this editor was wrong. But I can see the, there are advantages in both. Both systems have yeah. their place. Linear editing, for sport, you see what you get, you pass it through. So if a footballer goes, 
un, un, um, unpronounceable word, you can you can take it out, put a bit of effects in. You can't do that on an ab. It in out. Take that 10 minute chunk, you have no idea what it is until you play it out. And if you're playing it out live to air, that could go out. So that's the argument from my terms for tape editing. But I can see that for story editing, I, you can't hold a, a, a torch oh, to have no, 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 no. it. So, so many of the reality shows now, you couldn't, uh, yeah. you couldn't make them without the shared storage. Yeah. Right. And Big Brother, I mean, Love Island, I think the new one, you know, they all rely massively on shared storage. It wouldn't be possible. Yeah. I think the last sort of 18 years, um, um, well, I don't know if it's 18 years, but anyway, no, it can't be 18 years, sorry, it's eight. Bad. I was thinking of, uh, what's it, shared storage? Yeah, Big Brother's 98, 99. Because uh, mm. I was thinking about, um, uh, certain, I remember with Panorama, um, you know, well, the beginning of doing a lot of uh, multi-edit suite panoramas, fast turnarounds, and kind of working out the best ways of doing that was um, was really fun, actually. Uh, but, you know, like three, anyway, well, two, three, four editors editing a film in a few days, um, and how best to do it, and, you know, we really cracked it. It was brilliant. You know, uh, have, do you have a chunk of the programme each, or, you know, how you do it? And we just played around with different ways until we came up with a method that's um, you know used now. Yes, I, do, I do remember when Panorama asked me to do a special for 9-11 and we were going to have two editors and they actually got in a little Unity for us. They hired from Gearbox a Unity so we could access for the mm. first time without having to work it all right, out. Yeah, 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 there it was. But then you've got that other interesting thing is that every editor works very slightly differently and you've got to have some kind of uniformity yeah. if you're all working yeah. on the same programme. Yeah, no, we, what we did was we have, yeah, um, you know, you have a lead editor, so one of us would volunteer to be the lead editor and then basically everyone would do their chunk. That person would ideally do the first part and then they would receive the others and then they can just slightly stylise it. But if you've got someone who's using cut and mix for doing your audio, and someone who uses the rubber banding levels, then you've got to get those across. Well, you have a you have some you've got to have a standardisation between you. Have little meetings every yeah, now and again exactly. in the middle of the night, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's a nightmare. It all falls apart when you yeah. try and put it in together, and someone's got to mix the lead editor. I mean, in fact, in Big Brother now, I think they have three lead editors to finish the, the programme at the end of the day, and they all take separate chunks. Um, but, of course, it's all standardised yeah. so that they know, you know, the audio channels go here, voiceover is on, Channel 9, all of these things have to be exactly the same, otherwise it will just fall apart. Yeah. You don't have the time to mess around. To, to come back to, to Ross's point on, about sport, one of the, one of the problems uh, we had was how could we apply Avid to sport? Because here you are digitising a football match, the trouble is you're digitising and you can't edit it. And I remember that Avid knew that that was yes. a definite desire, so they yes. came up with something they called chunking. chunking. Good old you, chunking. Re you remember? I remember chunking, where yes. Where basically, you were digitising, and what was happening underneath, it was laying it down as like 10 minute files onto the hard disk. And as soon as the 10 minute file was down on the hard disk, it actually became, even yeah, though you were still digitising, yeah, the usable. editor could access could get it, at it and yeah. could start editing it. Because that was obviously crucial with a football match, you wanted to get on with it down. as soon as possible. Something I've just thought of um, that I noticed had changed is, uh, I mean, obviously, a lot more. With the Avid, dawn of the Avid, a lot more production companies were having their own edit suites. Yes. And um, so, you know, you could find yourself in all sorts of little rooms or and cupboards. And <laughs> or oh, Lord, yes. Or actually, <laughs> mm, sorry. All corporate the, companies as well. Yes, and all the yeah. different levels of maintenance. Some uh, looked after yes. and some not looked after at all. Yeah. I'm surprised you BBC no guys mixer. haven't said other non-linear systems are available. <laughs> mm. No, they're not. No, no, no not. not to my mind. No. <laughs> there was a stage, wasn't there, when I think the, we were talking about this um, before, about how the BBC were looking to have everyone and to turn it into producer, director, editors, and that they were all going to be working from hot desks and people were going to be working from headphones, and thankfully oh. that died a death. God, was it? Was yeah, it, was and it, was there, was every, there was a period when was it was... It was Cardiff that was setting up some massive system of central storage where everything had to be digitised in and it would be, a, be available to editors and directors and yeah. they'd all have an editing system on there. And, and this, yeah. so we started us, and we're digressing here, and I remember sort of asking when some guy from Cardiff came to talk to us about this, uh, right, um, we've got a bit of music here. How do we, ah, you would have to take that down to a, a central room and they would have to digitise it for you. So, so we couldn't do it immediately. 
I'm not sure our production's <laughs> going to like that, the fact that we're going back to the old system of a film transfer suite. Sure. Whenever you wanted a bit of sound off disc or off tape, you had to take down the transfer suite, go away and wait till they decided to transfer it for you. It's interesting how, never heard any more about that. No, I mean, I mean, anyone's ever done that. I mean, we've, we do have our shared storage for, for Avid systems, but the concept of this whole, that, because we also said, what happens to all of these rushes eventually? Who manages? Who decides when you delete stuff, etc.? Oh, I'm sure we'll get that sorted. I think we're very fortunate that, as I say, there was this desire to push everyone into desks and to have them all in the open plan offices, and that seems to have died a death. And edit suites now, still pretty much the same as they were 20, 30 years ago. It's still sort of a fairly nicely laid out room quiet and everyone's got their own space. Have you ever had to work in a multi-operational room with another Avid working? I've had to do that mm. once when I went to work for a corporate yeah, client. Once was enough, thought, I imagine. Oh, how, how do you expect oh, me to yeah. do the sound, judge the sound, with all this extraneous noise yeah. going on? Okay, I can put headphones on and that's not fun after a time. Yeah. Well, or when you, I you started online, yourself the client because sat you're behind you and I couldn't bear all these boys from the Sarches giving it all that behind <laughs> me. So when I bought my own, I put them in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nost for nostalgic sake, to, um, to hang on to any piece of kit, if I had room at home, I'd have a steam bed for a 16mm film. I have to say, and I've got one, <laughs> a tape joiner. Oh, because my like, oh, God, did that well. revolutionise film editing. Um, but it is nostalgia. I have no desire to actually use it again. I'm very, very happy with non-linear, avid type editing. I think if I had to um, look back over my 40 odd years and the things that arrived, came and went, I would go for the development beyond tape editing, which was a thing called a profile, which was a hard disk recorder that you could join up to a tape suite and it would give you instant access to any material. You could clip it up. And so the, the days of loading tapes and shuttling up and down were gone. So we're nearly non-linear, but it's all going onto tape. I think the profile was a fantastic machine. And um, nowadays, they're about uh, $30 on eBay in the States. <laughs> 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 I think I'll stick with a media composer. Um, mm. I quite like having it on the laptop, actually, as long as I've got a, it hooked to a big screen. And then another laptop for and doing other stuff on and yeah. I love the media composer as well, and having a media composer is great. But for nostalgia, I think it would have to be the Abacus A57 DVE, because it's just so much fun to play around with. My five-year-old son would love to play with all the knobs and, and move the pictures around, and all the little effects you can do with it. That would be great. <laughs> for me, it's been fantastic to see the 910 and the GVG mixer again. It's been, it has been about 20 to 30 years since I've last played with that setup, and it's just come back almost instantly. And I reckon within an hour, I'd be perfectly fine to sit behind there again and start cutting again. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think it's built into you and I, I, one of the things I remember to finish my bit was a tape client would come in with a one hour, one inch tape and you'd spool through it fast just for the start of the day and a year later you could remember everything on it when he came in for the changes. <laughs> <laughs> just because as an editor you just adopted a way of seeing everything and remembering everything, more or less anyway, you know. Mm. So when they wanted that shot they'd forgotten, you actually knew where it was more or less, oh it's about halfway through, you know, you go and find it and next mm. year you could still remember. So, uh, but I think you're also like what you're with at the moment, so I've, I've had Final Cut myself at home for two years now and, and I love it, I mean, just because it keeps me busy, mm. not busy in the brain as much as anything. Mm but there's so much new stuff all the time. That's why I asked the question, you know. And, and I don't have to earn a living anymore, so, but I still like to get on top of the bits they give me. And colour correction's the hardest by Which far. Which one, Final Cut Pro or Final Cut X? X, I've X. got now. I've got all three of them, actually, <laughs> so. Uh. For me, it's been like uh, time travel, like going back in time. It's been really lovely to to see all the kit, and I haven't actually uh, edited this year, so, well, not this year, but for about a year, so I'm uh, producing something, and um, so it's just, I've, I've, I've felt like I've yeah, gone back 30 years, and it's been really great to... It doesn't feel like that long ago to me, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> hear all the for sounds. Me, 32, 33 years since I first came across one of those pneumatic type edit suites. It's a long time. Mm. Do you miss them? Yes and no. I mean, there were a particular time in my life and it was uh, fascinating and, and 
and we did read it into submission and we did make programs with it. This is because it's not frame accurate. It drove me crazy. You're just trying yeah. to use it. I remember that. Um, yeah. They're close. Yes, yes. Uh, I, th I think an important thing was you walked away with the tape that was a real yes. thing. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, like, yeah, like nice. yeah I've, I've really enjoyed it actually because tape, tape machines are, was my total broadcasting life going from monsters two inches down to DV cam players and just getting at the machine again. I was sent so many hours shuttling up and down tape, doing this, learning about the machine, learning about the, the insides, all the menus, what they did, learning the tricks on the edit controller to make things happen faster because my game was all about making things as fast as you can. Get it on the air, get it finished quickly, and then you can have a little relax for 10 minutes. So that, playing with it, yeah, the grass valley, great. No, I've really enjoyed it, actually. It's been really, really good.